Good morning and welcome to the Health Professions Advising Center's Introduction to Health Professions Workshop. I would just like to start out by sharing with you all that every quarter the Health Professions Advising Center changes our catalog of workshops and events. This is a snapshot of what the Health Professions Advising Center offered throughout fall of 2020. Obviously, we're at the end of the quarter, so most of our workshops and events have passed. We do still have a HPAC ambassador panel focused on service opportunities in a virtual space on December 1st from 6 to 7 p.m., as well as a post-baccalaureate workshop again on December 1st from 3 to 4 p.m. So we do still have a little bit of programming remaining in the quarter um, prior to final exams, but we will be having a new catalog of workshops and events for winter 2021, and it will be delivered to you all in the same type of format where you can see a snapshot view of everything that we're gonna be offering to you all throughout the quarter. Again, these events and workshops do change quarterly. We do also offer content um, throughout the entire academic year as well as the summer quarter. So I'd like to start out our session today by just ensuring that we all are on the same page with what it means to be a pre-health or a pre-med student. Um, in HPAC, we generally use the term pre-health um, to categorize our students who are interested in pursuing a career in the health field. Some students may identify as pre-med specifically, but you'll likely hear me use the term pre-health throughout our session to be more um, inclusive of students interested in health careers outside of medicine. It's important to know that identifying yourself as pre-med or pre-health is not a major. You're not getting a BA or a BS, a baccalaureate degree in pre-med or pre-dent or pre-form. <clears throat> You're receiving a baccalaureate degree in an academic discipline, such as biology, um, environmental engineering, psychology, public policy, you're getting that BA or that BS, that baccalaureate degree in that academic discipline, and then your career trajectory is indicating that you want to go on to a career in the health field. So you will be taking coursework that's specific to your professional program. You will be engaging outside of the classroom in a way that's meaningful for your particular program. But these are possible health career tracks that you're pursuing after completion of your undergraduate degree at UC Riverside. That will become important um, during a, a slide later in our presentation where we talk about some things that are going to be true for your major, um, some things in terms of AP credit or retaking coursework are going to be possible or not possible for your major, and that may differentiate from what would be true or what would be possible for your health profession. You're at UC Riverside for the primary goal and objective of completing a baccalaureate degree, and then a secondary goal and objective of going on to one of 120 different health professions programs. There are a lot of different health professions. ExploreHealthCareers.org is going to be the most robust database of health professions, careers that are available within the United States. So if you've never been to this website, I definitely would encourage it. Again, ExploreHealthCareers.org. I would even book, bookmark it on your web browser because it may be something that you utilize regularly throughout your undergraduate education as you may move kind of fluidly in between health professions. Um, I think there is a little bit of a misconception that college students have or maybe society has as a whole that you need to enter your undergraduate education absolutely certain on what career you see yourself doing in the future. And certainly people, there are people that are lucky enough to really know those things at the, the ripe old age of 17 or 18. 
but most of us humans take some time to explore. We try different things on, you know, we take courses, we get involved outside the classroom, perhaps we get jobs and we start to see pros and cons of different careers and what we originally identified as our career interests may evolve as we go through our college process or, or even our work experience after we graduate. So this can be a great resource to just have in your back pocket to use um, whenever you're open to exploring various careers. On the left side of the screen are some questions that we find helpful to consider as you are exploring and confirming your interest in health professions programs. So the first two questions there are a little bit more academic related, you know, do you excel in math and science coursework and how do you feel about standardized exams? There are some health professions programs, um, particularly those at the doctorate level, like medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, optometry, that have more heavy science prerequisites. They require things like calculus and organic chemistry and physics, maybe some of the quote unquote higher level science courses that some students feel that they can excel in, some students might not be as excited to take. There are other health careers that require little to no science coursework. There's things like um, LMFTs or, or licensed marriage and family therapists who serve patients in a mental health related way. There's occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, uh, public health practitioners who are taking little, if any, science coursework at all. So not every health professions program requires difficult or more difficult coursework such as organic chemistry, physics, and biochemistry. The same idea exists with standardized exams. Um, some professional programs like medicine require the MCAT, dentistry, the DAT, optometry, the OAT, and pharmacy, the PCAT. Those are science-based standardized exams that don't really mirror anything that you all have taken through the SATs or ACTs. Um, some people know that exams are something that they're able to successfully conquer and other people such as myself may feel that standardized exams aren't really a part of their academic skill set maybe they do better in coursework than they do on science-based standardized exams and for that they may be looking at pursuing careers that require the gre which is the graduate record exam um, which does mirror the sats or the acts more specifically than like the MCAT would. Um, some students may be looking for careers like physical therapy or vet med or nursing that look towards exams like the GRE as opposed to a science-based standardized exam. In terms of scope of practice, um, most of my students would say they do enjoy working with people. They do like working as part of a team. Um, so I think that's generally true with most pre-health students. But you all do need to think about what we call the scope of practice that you want to have with a patient. I hear very, very regularly from students that they enjoy science coursework and they want to help people. They want to help patients or maybe specifically they want to help children or they want to help women or some type of specific group. And that's fine. But you really have to think about the way in which you want to help those patients because all healthcare professionals use both science and social sciences to improve the health and the life of their patients and their communities. That's basically a universal truth of all healthcare professionals. So you really have to think about what does quote unquote helping somebody really mean to you? What is that going to look like? What are the specific skill sets, the specific roles and responsibilities, the specific scope of practice that you're looking to have with a patient um, in your future career? And then lastly, to just round it out, thinking about the type of pressure that you are comfortable working in, some health careers, have more stress and pressure than others, like medicine, PA, nursing, pharmacy are going to be those essential frontline workers that are working um, nights, weekends, and holidays. 
right? So uh, in relation to that last point, their work-life balance, they're not working Monday through Friday, eight to five, generally speaking. Um, they do work nights, weekends, and holidays. They do provide critical care. Um, they may be interacting with terminally ill or very sick patients. Whereas you may have a different provider like a dentist, an optometrist, a physical therapist, who are still using science to assist patients in a health-related way, but they may have less stress and pressure. Um, they may be working more of a Monday through Friday, eight to five schedule, and they're very unlikely coming into contact with terminally ill or sick patients in a way that they're responsible for that patient care. So just giving you an idea of how to kind of think about some of these, and just the last one very quickly is mostly for my transfer students, thinking about um, how long are you prepared to be in school? And this may be relevant to a first quarter freshman as well. Some health careers um, are much longer than others with, of course, pursuing MD or DO medicine being the longest due to their residency process in addition to their doctorate level education. Um, that for some students is a deal breaker, that the length of schooling prior to entering the job market is something to consider when you know, selecting a career um, that you're gonna be working in for many, many, many years. So just some food for thought for you all to think about. In regards to data, this is some national data from the most recent application cycle that we would have complete, which would be 2018. This is not just California. It's certainly not just UCR. This is a snapshot of people applying to professional programs across the country. Most professional program applications are centralized common apps. So they're very similar to the UC common app or the CSU common app, but on steroids. It's based on a national scale and not just within the state of California. So I've placed kind of the most common, I would say nine or so professions that Charlie, Stephanie, and I advise for, with the exception of nursing. Um, UCR doesn't have a school of nursing, and nursing is an undergraduate degree, so I'm not going to get really too much into nursing right now. These are careers that are going to be at the master's and or doctorate level. So things as um, MDs, DOs, podiatrists, dentists, pharmacists, optometrists, PA, physical therapists, and veterinary. Um, this will tell you how many people applied to those programs in 2018, as well as the amount of people who matriculated. Matriculate is just a fancy word to say somebody was admitted or they've started the program. So it shows you the national acceptance rates for these programs as well as the average cumulative GPA of the students who've been accepted. More importantly, the average science GPA of students who have been accepted, as well as an average standardized exam score. Um, mostly we'll be talking about the science GPA of those students who have been accepted. That's usually the GPA that Charlie and I are referencing when we talk about academic competitiveness. Um, particularly for the programs I have on the screen, we're going to be talking science GPA, not really cumulative GPA. Again, there's 120 health professions, so that's not going to be universally true for every health profession, but it's true for the careers that I have on the screen right now. In terms of major, um, I think this is a question that is of importance to a first quarter freshman, first quarter transfer student. We, we see that to be a common question or concern for students who have recently matriculated to UC Riverside. And what this slide is intended to indicate is that there, there really truthfully, genuinely isn't a quote unquote best major that's suited for a specific health profession outside of nursing. Nursing is the one exception that I would have to this. Students who want to be registered nurses do need to complete a baccalaureate degree in nursing. It's called a BSN. UCR does not offer a BSN. I won't be really talking about that too much in today's session other than to say if you've identified yourself as a pre-nursing student, 
you're going to want to go ahead and make an advising appointment with either myself or Charlie, and I'll be showing you our contact information at the end. So this is just to, again, articulate about half of people that um, are admitted to medical school are science majors. Um, it's language as biological sciences, but that would be a kind of general terminology for something like biology, neuroscience, cell molecular biology, biochemistry, kind of all of that is considered biological sciences. But there are students who are admitted to medical school as math or physical science majors, quite a few that are humanities, social science, language arts majors, um, a few that are engineers. So a lot of different students are going off to careers in the health field. It's really about selecting a major that's best suited for you as a person, that's best suited for your academic skill sets and your interest, like what kind of curriculum are you interested in taking, that's the major that will likely produce um, you know, better GPA, something that you're more excited about, something that you're really excited to spend time learning about, you are going to have to take prerequisites for your professional program. But that really doesn't mean you have to major in a field in the sciences. You should major in something in the sciences because you really do enjoy and excel in science coursework not because you think it's required to go to dental school. Hopefully that makes sense. There are a lot of prerequisite coursework that might be required. We do have a more robust course sheet on our HPAC website, which Jessalyn will send to you all in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, I will show you where it is on our website. But generally speaking, for um, careers such as medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, veterinary medicine, physical therapy, and optometry, you're going to want to take one year of English. One year is either going to be two semesters if you were a transfer student, or it will be three quarters if you were a student who matriculated to UCR directly out of high school. We're generally going to be looking for one year of math. Um, if you're a UCR student, that would be two quarters of calculus and one quarter of statistics. If you are a transfer student, it will more likely be two semesters of calculus and one semester of statistics. We're also looking for one year of general chemistry, general biology, organic chemistry, and physics. Again, that's going to be three quarters if you took those series at UC Riverside two semesters if you took that series at you, uh, a community college. Then there's going to be additional recommended or required courses that's based on your health profession. So when I have biochemistry, human anatomy and physiology, microbiology, um, genetics, humanities and social sciences, that's um, prerequisite or required courses that are career specific and that's when you would want to reference the HPAC course sheet for a more robust explanation of which programs require which courses. I mentioned at the beginning there was going to be some things that were true for your major and they may differ for your health profession or vice versa. Um, this is a slide that will show you um, the things that are going to be different between your major and your health profession. So in regards to AP credit, your major will accept all of your AP credit um, and health professions sometimes do, but in terms of math and English, there are some professional programs that won't accept AP credit for math or for English. And so if you have AP credit for math, AP credit for English, you may need to take an additional course or two additional courses to supplement your AP math or your AP English. Those additional courses that you can choose from are found on the second page of our HPAC course sheet or the back side of the course sheet if you have a physical copy. Um, it would be math, 
9C, Math 46, Math 10A, or Math 10B if you need to supplement your math credit. It could be English 20A, 20B, 20C, or Creative Writing 56 if you need to supplement your English credit. Again, those additional courses are outlined on the HPAC course sheet that Jessalyn sent around in the chat. A little bit more complicated than that is the minimum requirement for prerequisite courses for health professions programs is a solid C grade or higher. At the UC system, and this is true at UCR, but it's also true at other UC schools, the UC system, a C minus is considered passing. So if a student has received a C minus in let's say chemistry 1A at UC Riverside, their major advisor is going to move that student into chemistry 1B. However, if you're a pre-dental student and you received a C minus in chemistry 1A, that would not be considered a passing grade for dental schools and we would have to discuss retaking that course at a different institution. I'm not going to get into how to do that, when to do that. Um, those would be conversations for an advising appointment. If you are a first quarter student, you don't have any C minuses. So this is just something to be mindful of. If you are a student who does have a C minus in a required course for admissions, then that's something that can be discussed during an advising appointment. All professional program prerequisites should be taken for a letter grade. That was added because in spring and summer, as many colleges transition to virtual learning, professional programs were temporarily allowing students to take pass or fails or, or what we call at UCR satisfactory no credit. Um, professional programs were allowing satisfactory and no credit grades for required courses. Now that we've been virtual for mm, almost three quarters, the expectation is that all prerequisite courses will be taken for a letter grade. And then probably most important on this slide is that if and when a course is ever repeated, um, so if a student takes a class, let's say again, they took chemistry 1A and they received an F in that class, then they retook chemistry 1A and received an A in that course. At UC Riverside, they will only be calculating the A into the GPA. However, both the A and the F would remain noted on a physical transcript, which means that when a professional program receives a transcript that does show coursework that's been repeated, they are going to recalculate that GPA to include both the F and the A into the GPA calculation. That becomes particularly important when we start looking at the science GPA specifically. So extracting out lower division and upper division, biology, chemistry, physics, math, and stat courses. We kind of extract those courses from humanities and social science breadth courses. And we look at a student's cumulative science GPA, which would include um, C minus coursework, repeated coursework, um, coursework taken at a community college prior to attending UCR. When we're looking at this science GPA, it really truly is a cumulative science GPA. For most of you, seeing an accurate application GPA isn't going to be a part of your UCR RWeb. It's something that you will most likely need to spend 20 or 30 minutes calculating for yourself. In HPAC, we would recommend that you use this quote unquote AMCAS Excel document. Um, it is found on the homepage of the HPAC website, which Jessalyn will send around in the chat. It is an Excel document. So it does work much better if you have a computer enabled with the Microsoft Office Suite. Um, 
that will allow you to have these macros enabled where you're able to um, select which classes are math and science courses. For my transfer students, you're able to use this column H here to differentiate coursework taken on the semester system versus coursework taken on the quarter system. You're able to enter in the units that you've taken for your coursework, as well as the grade and, of course, the course itself. You know, is it Chem 1A, English 1A, Math 5? Um, and so this allows you to keep track of the course, the grade, the units, whether it's science or not science, and whether it was taken on the quarter system or the semester system. It allows you to keep track of this for your freshman year, your sophomore year, your junior year, your senior year, and then even for alumni who take courses after they graduate for their post-baccalaureate year or years. So um, we can have you download this and keep track of your grades to monitor your science GPA. Again, and that would include any coursework that you've repeated. It would include community college coursework all of the coursework that you've taken at any college or any university since high school, um, or I guess during high school, if you took community college coursework, we're going to wanna to keep track of those grades to calculate a cumulative science GPA. Um, if you're a student who's never received a grade below an A minus, this might not be something that you necessarily need to spend time doing, because clearly you're a 4.0 student. This is a very helpful process for students who aren't sure of their academic competitiveness or their academic readiness. This is what this um, document is designed to help for a student who isn't sure if their GPA is competitive or not. Getting into some things outside of the classroom, there are over 500 clubs and orgs at UCR. Highlanderlink.ucr.edu is the most robust database of all clubs and orgs that UCR has to offer. We have so much. There's Greek organizations, there's cultural clubs, there's religious clubs, there's hobby clubs, um, there's social organizations, there are honor societies, there are kind of sports and hobby type clubs. There's so many ways for you guys to engage with your peer group and, and find a community that's going to be um, a supportive outlet for you throughout your college experience. And so this is another website I would recommend bookmarking and um, using this as a way to get connected with like-minded peers. Since I am a career advisor, specifically with the health professions, I wanted to highlight some of our flagship pre-health organizations. So these might be things that are construed as more professional experiences or academic experiences like AMSA, um, FDC for dentistry, pills for pharmacy, physician assistance of tomorrow for PA, precision for vision for optometry, or pre-vet club for um, vet med. These would be some great flagship organizations to get connected to if you're pre-dental, joining Future Dentist Club is gonna allow you to be connected with other pre-dental students across campus and um, you know, get connected with like-minded peers that are engaging in the same types of coursework and extracurricular experiences as yourself. But again, I don't want to devalue all of the other types of clubs and organizations and community service and, and just all of the robust things that students do. So Highlander Link, again, can also get you connected to cultural clubs, religious clubs, hobby clubs, social clubs, so on and so forth. Again, as a career advisor, somebody that's helping you all move towards careers in the health field, selfishly, we spend most of our time extracurricularly talking about clinical experiences and perhaps shadowing. These types of clinical experiences are designed to help you all explore and confirm your interest in medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, physical therapy, so on and so forth. 
again, remember that there's 120 different health careers that really do all use math, science, and social science coursework to better the health and the life of both their patients and their communities. Gaining clinical experiences and shadowing is a way for you all to try on different careers to see the pros and the cons of careers to see the challenges, the realities, the successes, the failures, the hope, and the sadness of any career that you are considering. I think those realities might get put under a microscope when we start considering careers in medicine specifically, like being a physician, being a PA, being a nurse, maybe being a pharmacist, um, that's where we're going to see some realities within who has insurance and who doesn't, who can afford their medication, who can't. Um, it's where we're going to start to see some of the, the legal or the business or the policy sides of healthcare um, and some challenges that those things may present to providers. So hospital volunteering programs, volunteering at nursing homes or maybe hospice, shadowing a physician or a PA, these are the ways that you need to start to learn about the realities, like I said, the challenges, the both um, successes and the failures, the hope and the sorrow within um, a career like medicine. COPE Health Solutions is probably the most common hospital volunteering program that we see for our students because it does operate through various locations and has a very robust um, size. It's a very large program. Um, COPE is operated through Riverside Community Hospital as well as Kaiser Riverside in our location, but there are locations in Orange County, LA, San Gabriel Valley, um, not too much in the Bay Area, but pretty robust around Southern California. There are other hospitals um, such as Loma Linda, Riverside County, San Bernardino County, which is Arrowhead. There, there's a lot of, of hospitals in every community. Some of you are in Riverside, a lot of you are not in Riverside. Um, some hospitals are allowing volunteers right now, some are not. So it's something that you may have to do some Google searching within your home community. Pretty much every hospital, nursing home, hospice has a way for somebody to volunteer. What you're hoping to gain through this volunteerism is something where you're bedside with the patient. So when we talk about clinical experiences or hands-on patient care, um, we do want you ideally bedside with the patient and spending time with the nurses. You will likely be cleaning patients, feeding patients, changing patients, um, running samples to the lab, maybe discharging patients, spending time with patients, um, helping with boredom and fear. That's what we mean by bedside care. It's probably not quite as sexy as you're envisioning. Perhaps you were thinking you're gonna be putting IVs into people or intubating people. Um, that's skill sets that definitely require licensure, um, that requires experience, um, certifications. So these types of programs, we're hoping that you're doing bedside care with patients, but in a very safe way for both you and the patient. Um, a lot of hospital programs might offer you opportunities to volunteer in the gift shop or the, the coffee card or food service or their administrative units. And that's certainly great ways to gain community service, but it's likely not going to help you gain the clinical experiences that allows you to, again, explore and confirm your interest. Sometimes students think that they want to be a PA, a nurse, or a physician, um, but then they volunteer in one of these critical care settings and might realize that the stress or responsibility isn't well suited for their um, personality or their career outlook, and they become more interested in something like dentistry, optometry, physical therapy, 
as you remember, hopefully remember I said earlier, these are careers that are generally considered lower stress. They work usually Monday through Friday, eight to five in an outpatient setting, not serving um, primarily terminally ill or sick patients. So if you become the type of student who realizes that might be a more effective patient care model for yourself as a provider, then it's helpful to gain some clinical experience directly in like maybe your own dentist's private office or maybe your own optometrist's private office, so on and so forth. Um, again, during COVID, uh, it's really up to the provider to determine if they have the appropriate PPE to allow volunteers into their setting. Um, some hospitals and clinics and providers do, some do not. It, it's very much up to the individual hospital, nursing home, hospice, or provider's office. Generally, I can say as the state of California remains in tier purple or um, continually returns to tier purple, these types of experiences will be a little bit more difficult to come across. Um, so hopefully we can move um, out of tier purple and we were seeing a lot more opportunities um, with lower COVID numbers. So this might be put on hold until after the holidays, given where we're at with um, public health recommendations. HPAC does do all the pre-health advising at UCR, but we don't operate in a vacuum or, or in a silo. Many of you will be working with your major advisor to ensure that you're completing the degree requirements for your major. Some of you be, may be working with the Career Center um, on a resume or interview prep or gaining internships, as well as working maybe with Honors or the Academic Resource Center and HPAC. Many or most students are utilizing multiple resources on campus to assist them in becoming successful professionals in the future. So what HPAC is providing is support through a very specific pre-health lens. We do individualized appointments for all health professions, although medicine, PA, nursing, and pharmacy make up a majority of the appointments that Stephanie, myself, and Charlie regularly see. There has been a strong uptick in public health, students interested in a career in public health, um, healthcare administration, as well as mental health counseling over the last six to eight months. So any of those careers on explorehealthcareers.org, Charlie, Stephanie, and myself are prepared to support students through. As you are experiencing right now, we do a lot of small group advising. We are three people who support a campus of just over 20,000 students, um, about five to 6,000 of those utilizing HPAC services. So you, you will find that in HPAC, we're doing a lot of small group workshops. Um, as you saw in our very first slide, we have a different profile of workshops and events that rotate throughout each quarter, depending on the application cycle. For example, most students are applying to professional programs in the spring, um, and so in fall quarter, we're not really doing personal statement writing because that doesn't align with the application cycle, where in spring quarter, we're doing a lot of personal statement writing be because it does align with the application cycle. Um, and I, I guess what I meant was personal statement writing workshops. Obviously, we're not doing your writing for you. We do have an electronic newsletter. Um, it's a weekly newsletter that goes out every Monday. So that's via email. We have um, a Facebook for social media. We have Instagram and Twitter. And then we do have a YouTube channel. Um, HPAC at UCR is our YouTube channel where we keep a repository of all of our digital content. We do have um, 16 ambassadors, as I was mentioning, Jessalyn, who's on our call today assisting. 
Um, we have 16 third and fourth year very successful pre-health students who support you in a more um, personalized and subjective way. Charlie, Stephanie, and myself as advisors are giving you objective information on how to become competitive for your professional program based on metrics that we see uh, you know, students applying nationally. Our ambassadors are also pre-health students who are also students majoring in something perhaps very similar to you. And so they are going to be providing you with more subjective information about their experience, things that they have found to be helpful to them or maybe unhelpful to them and sharing those experiences with you to help and assist you in having as successful as a college experience as they have had. So they're providing you um, a more personalized type of advising based on the fact that they're going through a very similar experience as you. They see students on a drop-in basis um, their schedule is available Monday through Friday. Uh, for fall quarter, their hours were 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. We will be adjusting that for winter quarter. They'll be seeing students from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Again, it's on a drop-in basis. Um, you don't have to schedule an appointment. They're available at the same time every week. You can see the same ambassador multiple times. You can meet with all 16 if that would be helpful for you as well. We have a uh, web page that has their bios on it, our ambassador bios that will tell you their year, their major, their health profession of interest, as well as extracurricular experiences that each student has been involved with. Um, Jessalyn just sent you all that in the chat. So that can be helpful for you to look at individual bios to determine which ambassador might be um, kind of a good fit or a good support for you based on what you're looking for. Lastly, I just want to um, touch base on timeline and then turn this over for questions. So most students definitely are thinking that when they apply to a professional program, um, they're supposed to apply at the end of their junior year of college. Then they finish their senior year and they matriculate directly into their professional program. Um, again, matriculate is kind of a fancy word that means to start a program. And we do sometimes have students that successfully apply to medical school, dental school, pharmacy school, PA school as juniors complete their senior year and directly matriculate into their program. We do see that from time to time. Um, however, unlike maybe the narrative that you're hearing in society that that's the normal way, what, what we actually find is the more normal way is that students successfully apply to their programs in their fourth year. So kind of at the end of their senior year, they're applying to their intended program. And then they have a year off, so to speak, prior to matriculation. In this application year, you're generally pretty busy doing essay writing and interviewing, um, and some other, there's some things called situational judgment tests and um, some pre-interview modules that we're now utilizing in a virtual space. So when we have a student that has a glide year or a gap year or a year off, um, you know, however you want to language that, it's not that you're going to be sitting around hanging out, doing nothing during that time. There, there actually is quite a bit of work that goes along with the application process. So when a student is applying as a senior and they have that glide year, you, you will generally have quite a bit of stuff to do during that year. Um, this is just, again, a visual representation to show you all that it does take about 12 to 15 months to apply to a professional program. It's, it's pretty similar to when you applied to UCR out of high school. Um, 
just a little bit longer. You applied about nine months in advance. You applied to the UC system in November of your senior year, and then you matriculated to UCR in September after you graduated. It's a very similar process, just a little bit longer. So you can work towards applying as a junior, but I just want everybody to know that it is a little bit more typical for students to apply their senior year or perhaps even one to five years after they've graduated. There's a lot of resources on campus for you, like so many, um, obviously too many that I could ever share with you in just this one session. Um, if you're not sure what you're looking for, like you know you need something, but you don't know what it is, go to ask.ucr.edu. That's gonna be kind of the centralized resource hub um, to hopefully get you connected to what you're looking for. We do have a new research, I'm sorry, community service portal. Um, this is great to help you all keep track of the types of things that you're doing outside the classroom. So if you're joining clubs, you're gaining clinical experience, um, you're feeding the homeless tomorrow at your church for Thanksgiving, um, you're delivering groceries to elderlies um, through, you know, leave it to us, or you're tutoring kids, you know, the type, you guys are doing so many things outside the classroom you have to keep detailed records of those items. You're welcome to do that in Google Docs or on your social media profiles, but this is like a university sponsored way for you all to keep track of the community service things or, or any types of clubs or orgs, any type of outside the classroom stuff you're doing. This is like a centralized way to keep track of that. Uh, at HPAC, um, obviously, we are virtual, as the entire campus is. However, we were able to convert our on-campus phone number to a Google phone number. So you can still make phone calls and text messages to our office or our front desk through this 951-888-1290 phone number. Um, this is our website as well as our email account. So in terms of scheduling advising appointments for transfer students, for juniors, for seniors, for alumni, for pre-nursing students, if you're thinking that you, you need to schedule an advising appointment at this time, you can do so by calling or texting the front desk or emailing the front desk at this contact. Again, we have an email listserv. We have a Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube account. And of course we utilize Zoom for um, all of our digital content. So these are ways for us to get in contact with HPAC. And I wanted to share just quickly our website. So again, this is our Health Professions Advising Center website. Um, Right here in the middle under frequently used resources is the course sheet and the GPA calculator and our quarterly events flyer that we went over at the beginning of the presentation. These are our HPAC ambassador profiles. So you can click on individual students to see their year major contact information, health profession and extracurricular experiences as well as their quarterly drop-in schedule. So this is for fall of 2020. It will change, it will look different for winter of 2021. This is Explore Health Careers, very, very robust and helpful database for you all to see a bigger picture lens of the 120 different health careers that you have the option to choose from within the United States, as well as our HPAC YouTube channel. So hopefully this resources in this presentation have been helpful for you this morning. At this time, I'll stop our recording and take questions.